I know you've got some amazing goals for this year, and I'm so glad you're here for strategy and inspiration to make them happen. Listening to podcasts like this is great, but nothing will change in your life if you don't implement. So now that quarter one of this year has flown by, I'm sharing some mic drop moments and tips from the first three months of this year. Make sure you implement these tips in your life and business so you can crush the rest of 2023. Confidence comes from getting down and getting back up. Like it's, it's having that over. I mean, that's not the only place confidence comes from, Mm -hmm. but when you realize like you're stronger than you think you are and that you can do the hard things, you start to get confidence, but you only get that if you're willing to take the risk, Mm -hmm. if you're willing to take the chance. Right. And, you know, like just even me coming out here, I don't doubt the outcome. I'm like, of course we're going to find a property. Like I have no doubt in my mind that we will find a property this week. Awesome. (laughs) Right. And that's Mm -hmm. kind of that, but that's the mindset you have to have about anything that you're doing. Even though like right now at this moment, we're going, Oh, (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's not looking too bright. We just have to work harder. Right. And, but most people will go, oh, you know what? Let's just, let's just turn around and mm-hmm. call this. No, no, it's not an option. Yes. Persist until persist until. So write this down. Confidence is about taking chances and not doubting the outcome, not doubting the outcome. Okay. So anything you want to ask me? Anything you want to say? Mm, no. I had something a minute ago and I didn't want to interrupt you, but keep my brain is real. But you have, this is your one chance to say anything. Hundreds of thousands of people are listening. Mm, lovely. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go back to what you said about your mindset. You have to prepare your mind. Yes. Like when I was diagnosed, I didn't just start praying and listening to praise and worship music and journaling. Like I did all those things prior to being diagnosed. My faith has gotten stronger from my diagnosis, but I was already like a strong person. So you can't wait till you go through a struggle or a setback. Um, I mean, you shouldn't. You can, I guess, but Mm -hmm. you shouldn't. Um, You should go ahead and prepare yourself. Yes, because it's like I remember at our wedding day, uh, Chris, my father-in-law, got up. He was the best man, and he gave the speech, and he said, it's not if problems arise in your marriage. It's when, and we're going to be here for you when, when they come. And I was like, Whoa, like we're not going to have issues. But then I found out like a week later we would. (laughs) So I'm like, yes, but that's how it is in life. There will be tests and trials. So I love what you're saying. Prepare now. And, you know, God talks about it being like, you know, renew our minds in Romans 12 too. renew our minds constantly every single day. And the way that you do that is even, I don't know if you heard me this morning, but it's like, before I got out of bed, I'm like saying, expand my territory, Lord God. Like I surrender my day to you, Lord Jesus. And I also prepare for the battlefield that is happening in my mind every day because it's, it's not like natural because of just our surroundings for us to think that we're going to win every single day. It's, it's really not natural. You have to be the person that acts like you're going to war and you're going to dominate today. Intentional. Intentional. And it's the stuff you're speaking and, you know, just bringing into your life. And I just want to point out, normally I would never have like people I hang, like the fact that Sarita's on this podcast right now is because I actually really love her and I love you. I love you. And I look at her. Yes, she's my cousin. But not like, well, you're married to Chase's cousin. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We're like fifth cousins uh, or something like that by marriage. <laughs> but I just call her my cousin. So anyway, so cousins, but also I look at her as an ally. So not just a friend because friends are cool, but you need allies in your life. And what I mean by that is Sarita is the type of person that she's she's here to win. So she's not going to be easily offended if, uh, you know, whatever. I haven't talked to her on a regular basis. But when I call her up, it's like, I feel like, okay, let's go. Like, there's no, like, offense there. Like, oh, Kayla hasn't talked to me in a couple months. You just, like, I know she's killing it. And Mm -hmm. 
all the things. If I really need her, I'll call. You see, you know that, right? So I think that's an important differentiation to make right now is like you can have friends in your life, those people that are going to make you feel good, right? They encourage you, but they're, they might be the people that go like, oh, you need to take a break. Oh, why are you leaving again? Oh my gosh. Like, isn't it, you know, good what you have right now? Like, do you really need more? Those are what friends kind of do. And we love those people, but you need allies that do not let you be complacent. And I feel like I'm an ally for you. Mm -hmm, You are. Because I'm like, okay, you're battling cancer and you're going to start another business right now Mm -hmm. because that's what's going to make you feel better. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to be like, slow down. She did. You did slow down for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And you're sometimes you need to. You Yes. And you're also having your later starts in the morning because you know that that's important to you Mm -hmm. when you used to just wake up and hustle Mm -hmm. right away. Yeah. So it's like you found your balance, but- I want every one of you to like find those allies in your life, you know, and sometimes allies are people that you don't even like, but they're the people that remind you of what you're capable of and just remind you of what's possible for you. And I think that it's really important to make that differentiation because I share dreams with allies. I don't necessarily share my dreams with my friends, even though my, most of my friends in my circle support me, but there are a few that are like, haven't you done enough? Can't you take a break now? And those are like not the people that are going to get me to where I want to go in my life. So find your allies and make sure that you're being a good ally to them at the same time. Now that, you know, we're at the start of a new year and I love that you just did this study of, you know, 10,000 millionaires. What was there a theme in what they invested in, in order to, you know, create a bigger net worth? Yeah. So the big, the two biggest things, which is funny, is kind of what we teach is, is just retirement investing. So like, you know, they did their 401k, all of that and paid for real estate. A lot of their net worth was in, was in real estate, whether it was, was it a, a primary specific home type of real estate or it was mostly residential. So okay. either their primary home that they had equity in, uh, or they went further. Yeah. And invested. So I think of course there were a not, a not, um, Anomalies. Anomalies, thank you. <laughs> uh, throughout of it, but that was it. And what's what's so interesting too is I'm like, it's such encouragement though, because the third, even what their careers were, it wasn't like law, your doctor, all of that. The third was actually a teacher. Oh, a wow. Teacher. But so I think a theme too was that it is, it's that consistency. And people get freaked out specifically with the market, like a year we had last year, and they freak out and they pause they don't want to invest because they're scared or they pull their money out because they're freaked out. And the key, one of the keys with investing specifically with the market is it's consistency. Because when it's at the bottom, it's on sale. You get to buy more mm-hmm. with the same amount of money that you would have at the height of, you know, December of 21. So you keep investing, keep investing, keep investing. And so that's one of the keys. Warren Buffett said, which I love, he said, be greedy when others are fearful and Ooh. be fearful when others are greedy. Ooh. And Greedy is kind of a gross word, but I, but the idea is so yeah. good. It's like, cause like Bitcoin, you look at Bitcoin, everyone was like, get in, get in, get in, get in. This is it. This is it. This is like the get rich quick. You make so much money. And then it's turned out to be like the biggest scam and flop and fraud and everything. Like I know. I'm terrible. like so thankful that I never, yes. I, I just couldn't understand it. And I have a rule. If I don't understand it, I don't invest in it. So and good. So yeah. I was so happy that my mind just never got it. <laughs> I know. So, and that was one of mine that I was like, okay, everyone's kind of getting greedy. Mm-hmm. Be fe- watch out. And then now in the market last year, everyone's fearful and they're stopping. And it's like, that's when you jump in because here's the deal. When the market comes back up, which it will, I just believe Always. in the American economy enough that it will. And the people that make money, this is it. This is what the wealthy do. They consistently invest. And even at the bottom, because when they make their money is when it starts to turn up and it starts to compound, they make all that growth versus the people that freaked out and they want to try to get in at the top. So it's yeah. that consistent investing, which is really, really important. A budget actually creates a lot of freedom for me. Right. It doesn't limit my freedom. It gives me freedom. It gives me permission to spend and not think about it. That if I want another $15 lemonade by the pool and I have the money for it, oh, I can spend it and it's great. Versus sitting here thinking, is this too much? Is this okay? Yeah. You know, and that, of course, that's a luxury example, but that goes to the grocery store. That goes when you're filling up your car with gas. Like it, you never again have to think, is this amount of money okay? Or if you go buy something for yourself that you want, thinking, 
Should that money have been somewhere else? Oh gosh. And you're second guessing, you're questioning, you get stressed, all of that. A budget answers all of those questions. You have a plan in place. You're the one that sets the budget. It's not like some budgeting God drops this budget that you have to follow. It's your money. Like you're, yeah. you're a big girl. You can set your budget how you want, but it still gives you limits and boundaries, but it allows you to do with your money what you want versus your money just controlling you. And you look up on April 15th on tax day thinking, I just made all that money that you're, where did it go? You'll never have that, that question again. You'll know exactly where it was because you were so intentional and it helps you hit your goals, everything, everything in life. When you do stuff on purpose, you're going to make progress so much quicker and faster and honestly pay, more painless than just letting things happen to you and being passive. Absolutely. So on that note of goals, let's say somebody is brand new to the budgeting world. They, they didn't have parents that even talked about a budget. And so they're in that reactive phase of money, right? Like, oh, I don't have enough. Oh my gosh, I got to go make more money. It's so stressful. What are some goals to set? Like when you're just getting started, you know, working a budget? Yeah, it's a great question. So first, you want to create the budget, okay? So I always teach a zero-based budget every month. So it's your income for the month minus all of your expenses, including some giving and saving, and that should equal zero. So every dollar coming in, is already assigned to a category. So you know exactly yes. where it's going. And if you've never done it before, I would go back and, and look at your bank account for the last three months and kind of just average out how much have I spent on restaurants, which will probably make you want to throw up because oh. <laughs> out to eat, you know, we spend so much money out to eat. Uh, how much am I spending at the grocery store? How much am I spending on gas? I mean, literally go through and categorize and kind of average out the past. But remember in your head, those past months, you weren't on a budget. So they, they're probably going to be bigger than what it would have been if you were more intentional. Being intentional. But it just gives mm -hmm. you a starting point to get, to get that out. And, and I don't want to breeze past that because there's something really powerful and scary to go and do that. And I understand that because it's like, I don't want to go back and look. Like it's going to, oh, I don't want to see it. Isn't that interesting? We don't, we don't want to see it. Yes, because we feel like we're going to have regret. We're going to have shame. Mm -hmm. We're going to start having all of these mm -hmm. emotions around money. And I want to just give yourself freedom. Give yourself permission to make a mistake. It's okay. We've all made mistakes in the past. And to know that, that that putting this down on paper, it's you facing what's going on. And usually in our head, the mistakes or the idea is more magnified and scary than once you put it on paper. When you put it on paper, you rationalize when you see something down visually versus just in your head. So it's going to give you a sense of control, even though you're like, oh, God, I hate that we, I spent that much shopping or whatever it is. You're going to at least see it and know and then be able to move forward from that. And then yes. uh, I would say the third, the second thing is to give yourself 90 days. So after you create the budget, you're going to go through and say, OK, I'm going to cut some of this out. If you have debt and you want to pay off debt with some of that, this is the place to say I'm going to shrink some of these categories or even take some off mm -hmm. and start throwing it at my debt. Um, but you're going to be able to, to, to look at that budget and give yourself 90 days for it to work. Three months. So if you start budgeting that first month, it's going to be a disaster. So remember like that crazy girl on Kayla's podcast and she's telling you right now, it's going to be terrible. And you're like, wow, I, uh, this is not what I thought. And that's normal. The second month, it's going to get a little bit easier. You may have to adjust throughout the month a little bit, but by the third month, you start to see this consistency and this pattern of, you can kind of expect it. And you're like, okay, this is what it is. So 90 days for it to work. So a couple of those, you know, rules of thumb again, go ahead and create that first budget, put it down visually on paper and give yourself 90 days for it to work. So I love that. And it takes me back to, um, I didn't start budgeting until after I became a millionaire, which is crazy. Uh, but then it was taxes, right? And I'm like, oh, I didn't realize how much money I was spending. And then when I finally did face the music, like you said, and I looked back and go, oh my gosh, like, you know, okay, I spend a lot on X, Y, and Z. And do I want to like do that for the rest of my life? No, the answer was no. And so I was really glad to like face the music and be like, okay, what do I want? What do I want the money to go towards? You know? And so um, I, I think about that and I'm like, gosh, if I would have started so much sooner, I would be like so much further ahead. So for the mommy millionaires listening in right now, like this is an exercise to do after you're done with this podcast. Like don't put it off, just do it now because yes. that's how you start to like get ahead in life is like Absolutely. Being, you know, extremely self-aware. <laughs> That's about. right. That's right. And you could do it a budget on a sheet of paper or Excel. There's a budgeting app called Every Dollar that I love. I was going to ask you about an app. Okay. Yes. Every Dollar attaches to your bank account. So when you use your debit card, 
those transactions come into the app and you can actually drag and drop it. So you can like drag it into groceries so you can see how much I have left in groceries for the month. So it, that is it amazing. keeps track of it, which is, it is, it's so great. And, and you know, budgeting, it's a, it's a habit. So it's going to feel uncomfortable at first, especially if it's new and that's okay. Change is hard. Change is uncomfortable. If you do something new, it's scary. I mean, it's all the things, but just keep with it, keep with it. And I promise you'll start to actually feel for the first time a level of control. We're like, oh my gosh, I'm like in charge of my money and it feels so good. Right now you need omnipresence. It's not enough to just have a podcast. You know, it's really rare. Some podcasters get lucky, but it's pretty rare to have a podcast and just sort of get lucky, get downloads and not have a social presence, not have a name, not invest in ads and things like that. And so getting lucky, those days are over. That was 12 years ago. You know, even I have had to invest a lot of money in growing my brand and my podcast on social media. You can still do it for free to a degree if, if, a, if a platform has organic traction. But really, the key is developing a personality that actually attracts your target audience. And so that's understanding your values. That's understanding your personality attributes. That's understanding your audience and actually mirroring your personality and your values to what you want to attract in an audience. So a lot of people don't realize this. When you're growing a personal brand, you actually want to speak and act as if you are your audience. That's how you're going to attract the people that you want. And so people usually don't think that all through. They're themselves and they don't realize that if you want to attract your audience, you need to act like them. And so studying your audience, mirroring them to a degree and attracting them, understanding the impact that you want to make and the messaging that you have, and then the ways that you're going to deliver it that is appropriate for the platform. Every platform has different features. Every platform has a different algorithm. And that's something that you're going to need to do distinctly per channel. And to me, that's the game of personal branding. It's like understanding your values, your personality, your audience, the impact you want to have with your audience. Also, the relationship you have with your audience. So for example, some people are mentors to their audience. Some people are friends to their audience. Some people are community builders or, or cheerleaders, right? So what is your relationship? Are you teaching something? Are you more just, you know, reporting on news? Like what is your role? you know, mm -hmm. and then the channel, like how are you going to deliver that content strategy in a way that actually works with the channel that you're on? Okay. I'm obsessed with this, the way that you've just broken it down into these, calling it a role. And that's probably why you're so successful is because you came, I mean, you were the lead in the play in college. And then now you're like, okay, this is the role I'm playing now. And, uh, my daughter, she just got casted as the lead role in her school play. Love um, it. She's really Wonka. And she's like, oh my gosh, mom, like this guy is so creepy. Like, I don't really, it's, it's like a hard role for me. And I'm like, yeah, that's the whole point of like proving that you can actually be an actress is like, if you can be Willy Wonka. Right. And so she's studying him and she's getting into the mindset of like this weird guy who loves chocolate, you know, and <laughs> I'm watching her like put on Willy Wonka and it's so cool. And, you know, a lot of people get stuck into that mindset of, I need to just be myself, but you're saying, no, you need to, you need to play the role that people want to follow you for. And once you, once you understand the rules, right. And that's kind of like a rule, an unsaid rule. Okay. Once you understand that, that's how you win at the game of social media, at the game of podcasting, whatever game you're playing, you have to understand the rules. 100% because brand reputation, your brand is actually consistency. All it is, is consistency in every podcast every caption, every comment, right? It's an opportunity for you be, to be consistent, to show people how you're going to show up. And mm -hmm. when you show people the same thing over and over, these are my values. These are the, these are the top messages that I have. This is my personality. This is my tone. This is how I talk. These are the emojis I use. They feel like you're an old friend, right? That's the goal. You want people to feel like you're an old friend that they know. On LinkedIn, I have this so unlocked that People that are just strangers, they text me every day like I'm their best friends. They're DMing me all the time. They're fighting for me in comments. I have no idea who these people are, but they feel so attached to my brand because I've showed up so consistently that they're like, I know Hala. Hala wouldn't do this. Like, I know her more than you do. And, and they're willing to, like, fight for me, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. I love that. And, you know, talking about LinkedIn, I feel like me and you have talked about LinkedIn because I don't get it. I, I, I like suck at LinkedIn, but I think if I had that mindset of like, okay, what's the role you want to play over on LinkedIn? Do you want to be the mentor? What would you say your role is over on LinkedIn? 
So my relationship with my audience is an inspiring mentor. That's my goal, right? Mm -hmm. I always want to come off as an inspiring mentor. So if somebody's trolling me in the comments and I feel tempted to lose my persona, I just think like, would an inspiring mentor do this? No. And so then I just move on and I'm like, all right, this is against my values. I'll just act within my values and be the halataha that everybody's expecting. And the cool thing about this is once you become a brand that is so consistent, people start sharing your face as if it's a commodity, right? As if it's a logo. (laughs) And when you're not an influencer, no one's going to share your face, right? But now I can put a picture of myself, of my face, or just any picture of me, and people will share it. Thousands of people will share it as if I'm a logo because I don't represent Halataha anymore. I represent an idea. I represent inspiration to them. Mm -hmm. I represent you're never too old to start something new. I represent you can overcome failure and win. I represent success is not you know, overnight and you got to work hard for it and you can be a minority woman and succeed. There's so many things that I represent and people are sharing my content, not because they're necessarily supportive of me, but they're supportive of what I represent. Yes. Wow. It's, it's so much bigger. Like when you commit to that, like, okay, here's what I'm going to be for my audience. You're going to have so much more impact than just being yourself. 100%. And it's more strategic, right? A lot of people go on social media and they don't really have a plan. And I try to teach people like, hey, like if you step back and you realize that branding is really just consistency, then you need to understand like, how, what do I sound like? What do I look like? Right? What's your visual identity? What are the colors that I use? What are the fonts that I use? What, What kind of stories do I tell? What are the main messages do I have? And it's just all about consistency and, and almost repeating yourself over and over again, It's not the same stuff over and over again. It's iterations, but just being very consistent about what you want and who you want to attract. And that's how you build a brand. What would you say is a hack for people having more energy? Because I feel like that's something that a lot of listeners struggle with. And they they immediately go to caffeine. And I'm trying to, you know, show people stay away from the caffeine because it just increases your anxiety. (laughs) Right. Well, there's sort of two things for, for energy. So one is sleep and one is exercise. And they really, they really go together. So a lot of times people think that if they're, they're, they're lagging in energy, that they're like too tired to exercise. But actually research shows that exercising tends to boost energy, not diminish energy. And so if you're feeling kind of sluggish, that's a good reason to exercise. Um, also, exercise will help you fall asleep faster and sleep more deeply. And most adults need at least seven hours of sleep. And so really make sure that you get that sleep because a lot of times people will say, well, I've really trained myself to get by with five hours, but very few people are true short sleepers. And when when scientists study those people, they find that they're quite impaired. And we, we really get accustomed to feeling tired. We don't realize how tired we are. And if you're going, uh, again, another thing to do is to try to get morning light. Morning light um, is very important for the circadian rhythm. Uh, It resets all kinds of very, very subtle processes in the body. So if you can go outside and get the morning light, like maybe you're walking your dog or even just like going outside with your cup of coffee and like just getting that morning light in your face, getting some exercise and like setting an alarm so that you go to bed, Uh, you know, you don't start accidentally binge watching TV or answering work emails when you really should be going to sleep, those all will work together because the circadian rhythm will help you fall, feel sleepy at the right time. Exercise will help you fall asleep faster and sleep more deeply. And then getting that sleep will help you get the more energy. Um, so you want to think about, you know, sort of um, thinking about each of those elements uh, for, for energy. I love that. Now, when you're talking about, you know, bringing on the five senses, okay, so with, you know, getting the sunlight, it's kind of like, is it touch? Would that be kind of touch or is that sight? Or I think sight. 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 (laughs) That's like you can't touch the sun, Kayla. Okay. Uh, (laughs) What are some things like throughout the day, right, that they can do to use the five senses to get that energy boost? Well, one of the quickest, easiest ways to get an energy boost, and people know this, but tap into this, is to listen to one of your favorite upbeat songs. 
This is one of the fastest ways to intervene in your mood. You know, have a have a playlist, you know, have your high energy playlist and you start playing, you know, you really got me from the kinks or something like that, or whatever your what whatever would be on your playlist. For the book Life in Five Senses, I created something called my audio apothecary. Cause I'm like, when I need to give myself like that mood boost, this is like this is my medicine cabinet would be listening Ooh. to these songs. So that's a really good way um, is so do, so doing that. Um, another thing is uh, kind of on the opposite is you might want to use white noise or pink. No- I like pink noise better myself, which is a slightly different kind of sound of white noise to block out annoying sounds, especially if you're in a place like maybe you're in an open plan office where you might be distracted by other people's sounds. You're working in a coffee shop, you're working at home and there's distracting sounds. You can keep your energy up by listening to white noise because then you're not having to like use your energy to like stay focused and block out distractions because that's very draining. Mm -hmm. Um, With smell, again, just give yourself a hit of a good smell. I think it really, it kind of wakes you up to like really um, notice the way that something smells. And you also might want to- So it doesn't matter what kind of smell. It's just any smell. Well, that's a great question. (laughs) It turns out that smells do not come with associations. Like from the minute that we are born, we're attracted to sweet tastes and we, and we reject bitter tastes. And that's Mm. important because evolution is trying to get us to have things that are likely to give us energy, like sweet things, but toxic toxins often taste bitter. So it's trying to get us to reject toxins unless we overcome it deliberately, like with something like coffee. Smells, no, there are no killer smells. So the so evolution doesn't waste its its energy giving <laughs> us associations. So you might say like, well, lavender is relaxing. But in other parts of the world, lavender is considered exhilarating and bracing and energizing. So there's no, if somebody hands you something and says, oh, this will energize you, it's only because you associate it that way, but you may have your own set of associations. That's a great thing to tap into or create, but it's not like there's a right or wrong answer to that. So whatever you find to be energizing will work for you. Smell it up. I, I always keep Smell a peppermint essential oil in my car because I drive so yep. much with the kids back and forth. Uh, I, when I, I'm going, Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm tired. I'm just <laughs> smell it really yeah. quick and it gives me a little yeah. boost. So, well, anything mint does have that little kick to it. Yeah. That's a great yeah. idea. I like that. Yeah. 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 That's a great idea. And also sometimes there's just the, the, the association, if you're like, this is going to give me energy, yeah. it, sort of, it sort of does because you're the like, placebo it, too. <laughs> the placebo effect is real. Yeah. I mean, there's so many things that we can be doing if we just live like with intention. And one thing I'm picking up from you, Gretchen, is you're really good at asking yourself great questions Mm. so you can get a better outcome. You know, a lot of people go, oh, why am I tired? Why am I this? You say, what can I, what can I smell right now to help invigorate me? What, what song can I listen to right now that will give me a little more pep in my step? And, you know, like I'm a true believer that the quality of the questions you ask yourself, you know, directly correlate to the quality of your life. 